on. We're live. Well, this is exciting. Um, Dr. England is going to present us a case. Why don't you introduce yourself, Julie? Um, I'm Julie England. I'm a newly third year internal medicine resident here at UAB. And our, our uh, president of Unremarkable Labs, Dr. Mira. Hi, everyone. If you don't already know me, my name is Natasha. I'm also a brand new third year at UAB. And, and we're fortunate to have them. So tell us a story. A story, okay. Um, the story starts with a 41-year-old female who presents with nausea and vomiting. <sighs> nausea and vomiting, so how much? And for um, how long? Okay, so uh, it's been going on for about two or three weeks. However, for the past two or three days, she hasn't been able to keep anything down at all. Before that, was the vomiting intermittent or did the vomiting just start two or three days ago? So, so, it's, so the vomiting has been going on for like probably two or three weeks, um, but she was able to keep things down here and there. Um, so um, since this is Unremarkable Labs, what I'm going to do right now is say, what am I expecting? I can always be surprised. Um, if she's really vomiting a lot, we would expect a metabolic alkalosis. Um, if she's really vomiting a lot, uh, can't keep anything down for two to three days, you would expect that she'd be volume contracted and she'd have a metabolic alkalosis, often hypokalemic. Um, but a lot of other things could be going on. Nausea and vomiting is very nonspecific. Uh, is the, you know, uh, away from the lab, are we thinking uh, that this is a gastrointestinal problem or is, this, is it a systemic problem that's leading to nausea and vomiting? Uh, so we're going to need to know more about her. What does the vomitus look like? Um, it just, it, it doesn't have blood. It, it just looks like whatever stomach contents she had. So it's, it's digest, it is digested. Um, recently she hasn't really eaten enough to say if it's digested or, I mean, previously over the past few weeks, yeah, it would be like some partially digested food, but recently it's been more just like stomach secretion clear. Right. So, so the food's getting to the stomach. So the first step is is she vomiting because things are stuck in her esophagus? But that's usually undigested food. That's usually undigested food. Uh, so now it's getting down to the stomach, which means there could be a problem with the stomach. So if we find out she has diabetes, uh, she might have gastroparesis. Um, she could have an ulcer. Uh, she, she could certainly have uh, a, a cancer, a gastric cancer. Um, but then there could, there could be duodenum problems, there could be jejunal problems, but then it may have nothing to do with the GI tract. Um, could be biliary disease, could cause nausea and vomiting. Uh, any liver disease could do that. Um, could be pancreatic disease. You certainly would get that. Now, usually with, pan usually with pancreatic disease, you're also going to tell me that she has a lot of pain. And you haven't you haven't said the word pain yet, um, but then just any systemic illness could present with nausea and vomiting. This could be brand new presentation of uh, of uh, type one diabetes for all we for all we know. We really don't know very much just yet. Um, uh, it would be nice to know if she's had any uh, diarrhea along with this. Sometimes people have diarrhea and vomiting, and that might be a clue. Or she had constipation. Uh, we're going to need, need to get some past medical history. Has she, um, it doesn't sound like a small bowel obstruction because you didn't mention feculent vomitus. It's one of my favorite words, feculent. Um, and so I'm, I'm still very, very confused and keeping a, a very, I'm not ready to even test a diagnosis yet. There's, because it's too nonspecific. Um, so to answer a few of your questions, um, her bowel movements really haven't changed. Okay. Um, no diarrhea, maybe slightly decreased uh, volume and frequency over the past couple of days just because she hasn't been eating. Um, she's not constipated, though. Okay. Um, 
she is having some sort of generalized like kind of bilateral lower quadrant sort of achiness okay. um, any any uh, b symptoms um she has had some weight loss um she's not sure how much but her clothes are certainly fitting looser over the past probably two to three months so so she started losing weight before this nausea and vomiting mm -hmm. okay no fever no fevers no chills okay um Uh, chest pain, shortness of breath, all the other urinary tract infections, pregnancies. Is it, it this right. could just be a brand new pregnancy for all I know. Right. Yeah. So um, no chest pain, no shortness of breath, um, no dysuria. Um, she has had her tubes tied um, and she still has regular normal periods that um, when you go into detail, she says they're not excessively heavy. Okay. So. But I had I had had to throw that out there. Forty one, she she certainly could be at risk. I assume she's had her tube ties because she already has some children. Yes, uh, yeah, she's had you, mo children. most people who have their tubes tied uh, already have some children. Um, any uh, joint pains, uh, muscle pains, headaches? No, no headaches, no joint pains. Um, no rashes. Uh, dysuria, polyuria. No, um, she's actually been urinating quite a bit less because she's been vomiting everything up. So. Okay. Okay. Um, past medical history. Who is who is this lady? Um. So she really doesn't have any significant past medical history. Um, she went to an urgent care and got some PO Zofran. Um, she's had two healthy kids, ages eight and 11. She's had a C-section. She doesn't smoke, drink, or do drugs. She's a stay-at-home mom. Um, she is originally from Mexico. She moved to the U.S. seven years ago and has been here ever since. So every time I hear Mexico, the probability of tuberculosis increases, but she doesn't have most of the things you'd expect with tuberculosis. She doesn't have a fever, um, although we can, we, we can never get rid of that. Uh, do we know what part of Mexico? I didn't ask. Okay. Um, uh, there, there are other things that that for for which that could be um, important, but uh, probably not. Well, when you don't know what else to do, examine the patient. Sometimes things show up. Okay. So she is tachycardic and her blood pressure is low, which suggests she's probably volume contracted. She only weighs 80 pounds. She's a small woman. Mm -hmm. So we don't, uh, know, we don't know what she weighed before or do we? Yes. So on further history, she said normally she weighs about 130 pounds. Okay. That's a lot of weight loss. A lot of weight loss. Okay. So uh, uh, she's, she has, she's tachycardic, tachy. What's tacky mucus, tacky mucus membranes, so dry mucus membranes. That it that must be a slang that I don't know. Okay. I, I tried to be concise to fit it all on the slide. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I, I tweet also. Uh, mildly distended, mild tender palpation, lower quadrants, lower quadrants, um, bilateral lower quadrants. Uh, that, you know, uh, could she have diverticulitis? I don't think so. It doesn't make sense. Somebody got a CT of her abdomen. But let's just get, this is unremarkable labs. L let's look at her CBC and her uh, basic metabolic panel. Well, that is uh, certainly what we expected. Uh, so uh, I don't think that we have to prove that uh, this is a metabolic alkalosis. Um, there's no reason to think with a, a uh, pulse ox of 98% and no history of lung disease that this is compensation for respiratory acidosis. Her anion gap is elevated at 22. Now that doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, she's likely to have both 
ketosis and lactic acidosis. Uh, her blood pressure is low. She's tachycardic. She's probably volume contracted. She's not eating. So she should have some ketosis. She should have some lactic acidosis. Those things should get better with volume, I would think. She is, uh, she, she does have hypokalemia as we would expect. She has hyponatremia as we would expect. Why? Because she's volume contracted. She is getting in as much water as she can, but she can't get in any solute. She has that very high BUN to creatinine ratio, even though she's not eating much. Again, this is all looks very much like volume contraction. Now, what's weird here is that she has a heck of a lot of platelets. Uh, she's quite anemic. Um, could the anemia have something to do with this? Is the anemia secondary or primary? She's had two kids. Um, and, uh, I'll, you know, we talked about her periods are normal, but what is normal for her? Does she have heavier periods than, than other women? What type of a diet does she eat? So, um, the way I would list the problems now are, uh, the throm thrombo uh, thrombocytosis, which may, may just be acute phase reactant, but certainly is something that we have to consider. Is there uh, an underlying hematological problem? She has anemia, so I'm certainly going to want an MCV. Um, it would probably be very nice to look at a peripheral smear because of all these platelets. Uh, her white count is fine. Um, and uh, I would suspect that she could easily have uh, uh, B12 deficiency. She could easily have iron deficiency. Um, we don't know whether she's had previous labs and whether these, these are a change or she's new to our system. Uh, the, the, uh, back to the anion gap, it's 22. I think the anion gap and the increased BUN uh, are gonna improve fairly quickly. Will her potassium improve? We're going to have to give her potassium to, to correct her metabolic alkalosis. Would I bother to get a VBG? I don't think I would in this particular case because I have no reason to think that there's a respiratory acidosis going on. You haven't described anything about uh, observed weakness. She seems to be breathing just fine. Uh, if you want to get a VBG, I wouldn't mind. I just don't think it's going to help us very much. I would check a magnesium. I'd be very concerned about phosphate in this lady because we're because we're likely to give her refeeding syndrome. I'd be very, very thoughtful about giving her anything with glucose. So I'd probably uh, start her out uh, because it's a metabolic alkalosis with normal saline rather than lactated ringers. Normal saline is particularly good for uh, uh, for that, and I would add uh, enough potassium to it. Um, how do you decide how much potassium to add? Um, her potassium is not that low, so I would probably just give her five milliequivalents per hour. You can go up to ten, but you're you really run the risk of hurting the veins, and so I tend to be conservative because she's not that far down, and we and we'll. Once we see whether or not the volume contraction can cause the nausea and vomiting, does volume get rid of the nausea and vomiting while we're trying to sort that out? Um, I would just add, um, I'm probably gonna give her uh, like 250 cc's per hour. And so I'd add like 20 milliequivalents to a bottle of lactated ringers. Lactated ring, I mean to normal saline. I don't wanna use lactated ringers in this particular case. Uh, what questions do you all have for me? Did, I, did that all, all that make sense, uh, Julie and Natasha? Uh, yes, sir. I did have one question. Could you sort of expand upon saying that we're going to need to replete her potassium to correct her metabolic alkalosis? Yeah. Um, the, I don't remember the pathophysiology, but you just can't do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You just can't do what you have to. We're, we're going to give her saline and her kidneys. The, the low potassium is going to uh, have her hang on to bicarbonate. And we're going to also check her magnesium, make sure we can replete her uh, bicarbonate. Uh, but uh, 
Um, that's all I can tell you is that you got to you you, you got to fix both, and volume should fix the metabolic alkalosis. Volume should fix the metabolic alkalosis. If it doesn't, then we're going to have to think about uh, other uh, other issues. Um, I I hope that the, the that platelet count is just acute phase reactant, and I really want to know more about anemia. I wish Tori May was with me right now to get her um, opinions. Yes. So. Um... If you go, if you bring the box down just a little bit further, Natasha, her uh, MCV is sixty eight. Um, with uh, that, that was the anion gap that was pre calculated, but we'll go with Dr. Centaur's anion gap. Um, and then Natasha, a little bit further, you'll get the rest of the hepatic function panel there. Okay, so. Um, her albumin and protein are probably elevated just because uh, she uh, for this because she's uh, over over hydrated for all intents and purposes. Um, uh, that, I think that's gonna that, that that should should change just with stuff. Lipase is elevated. We did mention that her alkphos is okay. AST and ALT not too exciting. MCV of sixty eight. Is concerning, and so therefore, um, I don't think I, I think I, the ferritin may not help us in this case. If it happens to be low, that's going to be great, but it is an acute phase reactant, and mm -hmm. so most of the studies that that brag on how good ferritin is are are routine outpatients. She's not a routine outpatient, and so if her ferritin's a little bit elevated, I'm not going to get excited. I'm much more interested. In her, in her iron iron binding capacity and her percent saturation, because I can't I can't trust the ferritin alone. So um, I did not write them down, and I'm currently not able to log in. But she does have iron deficiency anemia. Okay. <laughs> um, not not surprising. Now the lipase being high, that's mm -hmm. that's really quite interesting. Um, so now I'm starting to think of all, all kinds of strange things. Uh, could she have uh, uh, IgG4 uh, that can present with, with pancreatitis and could cause all these kinds of problems, uh, autoimmune pancreatitis? Uh, could she have celiac disease? Um, there, th this gets much more complicated because of that lipase. Could she have passed a gallstone? Um, probably, probably not right now. She may have passed one before. I'm, I'm sure somebody did a CT of her abdomen when she came in. She had nausea and vomiting. The emergency department did a CT abdomen. I'm interested in it to see if it get, gives us any clues. Um, and actually, I'm really interested to see what the pancreas looks like. So uh, if, it, if it were something like IgG4, then you expect her to have a sausage-like pancreas. Um, we might be able to see com the common duct. Um, she's awfully young to have uh, uh, one of the cancers of that. Uh, she doesn't complain of itching. So I, 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 she's probably old enough um, to have, uh, um, so, she, so she surely doesn't have primary sclerosis and colon just, but she could have biliary, uh, it used to be called biliary cirrhosis, but, uh, it's called biliary liver disease now, or something like that. Primary biliary, it, they changed the name. Do you remember what they changed the name to? No, I, I still call it PBC in my brain. I don't know. Yeah, but I think they actually, I, I think the hepatologists have changed that name. So what, what does the CT show us? So her CT scan showed a mildly, I don't think I wrote this down here, but it's a mildly distended stomach um, and bilateral large ovarian masses concerning for ovarian cancer. And that's, uh, so ovarian cancer can, can, can do almost anything. Uh, and that's, you know. But the case isn't over yet, Dr. Central. I'm sure it's not. So, <laughs> so tell us what happens now. So um, she underwent bilateral oophorectomy. Um, and the pathology came back uh, consistent with gastric adenocarcinoma. 
gastric adenocarcinoma. Had she, had, she, had she had an endoscopy before that? Not at, not at this point. So basically the CT scan just showed that she had these bilateral ovarian tumors. It was presumed based on her presentation and her age that this was ovarian cancer. They took the ovaries out and they found gastric adenocarcinoma, which was unexpected. Um, her nausea and vomiting didn't really improve. And so post-surgically they got a repeat CT scan um, which this one still continued to show the mildly distended stomach. But now that we had that path saying that this was a concerning for gastric adenocarcinoma, the radiologist did call on the second CT scan, um, some mildly thickened uh, gastric mucosa near the gastric antrum. So um, um, did you check a B12 level on her? I'm sure they did. I don't, I need to, I don't have access to her chart right now. So do, do you know, do you know, so what, what I'm thinking about, okay, so there's, so there's, there's two reasons that uh, she could have iron deficiency. There's three reasons. One is because she's a 41 year old woman. Mm -hmm. The next one is uh, that she has a slow bleed from the gastric cancer. The third one is if it has involved enough of the antrum, she might not be able to absorb the iron she eats. So if you have uh, atrophic gastritis and you lose your antrum. So in the old days, the, the uh, surgery for ulcer disease was uh, an antrectomy and a gastrojejunostomy. And they would, they would get uh, first uh, iron deficiency because they, they, you need acid in order to um, uh, be able to absorb the iron that you're eating. And then they'd get B12 deficiency because they didn't make an intrinsic factor. So if her antrum is all gone, it'd be very interesting to know whether or not she also had B12 deficiency. Um, it, it's just a thought for, to keep in the back of your mind uh, in terms of people who, who have atrophic gastritis. That's, so th that's, that's a really sad case. Did anybody check a, a um, cortisol on her? Um. Let's see here. I can I can pull that up for you. Okay. And the reason I'm thinking is if she had metastases to the ovaries, <laughs> why wouldn't she have metastases uh, to um, the adrenal glands? And if she had uh, uh, metastases to the adrenal glands, that, that could be a reason for uh, hyponatremia. Uh, the right. lipase still we haven't resolved. Um, it may just be from the vomiting, I don't know. Yes, the, her, her elevated lipase was, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't it's significantly elevated and her pancreas was normal yeah. on CT scan um, and she wasn't having epigastric pain. So uh, we just attributed that to her vomiting. Let's wow, see this here. is a really sad case. And um, you, uh, did you yeah, have, have a her, Yes. I have it pulled up, but it's taking it a second. I can tell you though, the, um, so yes, this was, um, this is a Krukenberg tumor. So this is what we learn about in medical school um, where it's a, it's a tumor that, that metastasizes to the ovaries and typically it's a GI source um, that metastasizes to the ovaries. Um, and so, my learning points for this case um, are, let's see. So, so the Krugenberg tumor, it typically comes from the GI tract, usually the stomach and colon. Um, it can actually come from endometrial cancer or breast cancer as well. Um, and gastric cancer, we learned there's usually two types. There's the intestinal type and di the diffuse type. Um, and importantly, this disease is usually asymptomatic until the disease is quite advanced. And here in the United States, we don't screen for gastric cancer. So 50% of patients have distant metastasis at the time of presentation. Um, and uh, iron deficiency anemia is not uncommon um, and can be seen in about 20% of cases. Um, and usually you don't see overt gastrointestinal bleeding, so you won't see like hematochesia or, or hematemesis, but you will see 
um, it's not uncommon to see iron deficiency anemia on labs and they believe it's primarily due to just um, oozing from the tumor uh, mm -hmm. inside the stomach. Um, so gastric cancer risks most commonly is H. pylori infection. It's, it's, I think we often forget that H. pylori is considered a grade one carcinogen by the CDC. Um, and then um, importantly, the gastric cancer has uh, quite a bit of like a, a geographic uh, distribution, which they think has, has somewhat to do with diets, specifically like salt preserved foods or salt cured meats and salted fish or nitroso compounds. Um, so we, so screening isn't widely performed, but countries that have a high incidence, including Japan, Korea, and then some Latin American countries, including Venezuela and Chile, they do perform screening. Um, so interestingly, there's um, in the literature right now, um, kind of a push to start gastric cancer screening in Mexico because it is one of the countries with a higher incidence, but they don't have formal screening guidelines. Well, that that, that is fascinating. Uh, uh, was there any treatment available for her? I mean, this is this is extraordinarily interesting, but extraordinarily sad. Yes, and so she ended up having um, some stents placed uh, to make it possible for her. This was, you know, a gastric outlet obstruction yeah. causing her nausea vomiting. So she had a stent placed, which helped for a while. Um, she was uninsured, but she was getting uh, care through our uh, charity care facilities. Um, and so she was getting chemotherapy through them. Um, but unfortunately, she just continued to progress and passed away on hospice a few months ago. Well, um, God, you hate to hear stories like that. Was the thrombus was the thrombocytosis felt to just to be an acute phase reactant? Yes. So thrombocytosis was twofold. One, when someone has pretty significant iron deficiency anemia, they can have thrombocytosis right. because of that. And so our um, our attending was actually an oncologist, hematologist, and um, he said that he expected the platelet count to improve. Um, after her iron stores were repleted, which is what we saw. And did, and did you replete them with IV iron? Yes. Um, we just we just had a podcast uh, released on the risk of uh, um, anaphylaxis from uh, IV iron in with the current things we use, and it's less than one in a thousand. Uh, I, I use a lot of IV iron, and I, I think that's obviously where you'd want to go here. Uh, I assume that her um, basic metabolic panel labs improved with volume. Um, they did uh, quite. She, you know, being a young, healthy body, otherwise her her BMP improved pretty quickly once we got her hydrated and her electrolytes replaced. And did I you... do have her eyes pulled up now. Her. Oh, good. Iron level was 19 with a TIBC of uh, 381 uh, and a ferritin of 11. Oh, so, so despite all of the other things for ferritin, uh, uh, you could have made the diagnosis from the ferritin, but you could also make it from the percent saturation. Right. So, well, th that's, th th this is uh, fast. Fascinating, and I think there are some good lessons. I assume you get, you tried to replete her potassium as well as you could. Yes, we did. And once we got her nausea vomiting controlled, you know, we were able to keep her potassium at a normal level. Um, did, did you give her thiamine? We did. We gave her empiric thiamine. We didn't. Yeah. I don't think we checked a level on admission, but we empirically gave her. Yeah, I, I I don't think there's really there's almost no reason to check a level of thiamine because it takes so long to come back. And when you need to do it as a patient like this, if you're gonna start, if you're gonna start feeding this lady, she's at risk for all the complications of refeeding syndrome. So you have to check the phosphate, you have to, you have to uh, empirically give thiamine the, so she doesn't get any, any of the different uh, berry berries or uh, um, any of the other complications of thiamine deficiency. Um, I think this would be classic, somebody with nausea and vomiting for this period of time, but very, very sad case. Thanks so much for presenting it to us. Natasha, what are your big take-home points? Um, 
So it was good to review. Um, I definitely need to read more about why you, I know that you need potassium to correct a metabolic alkalosis, but um, I will need to review why, because I'm not sure either. Um, but I think this case was nice because it was just different. Um, it was not at all what I, I was expecting when she said the patient came in with nausea and vomiting. Um, it was a good review of a pretty rare pathology. And then we talked through a lot of different things like B12 deficiency and just like anatomical review in terms of um, like B12 and um, needing like for patients that have had an androctomy or something like that. Um, and then I think the other thing was just going through like an undifferentiated patient with weight loss. I think that's not a very common complaint either necessarily. So, cause when yeah. I think ovarian cancer, I think some weight loss, but I like the textbook is, oh, their abdomen is like very distended, but they lose weight. And she was just, you know, mildly distended. And so, yeah. So it, it's uh, to me the the m most difficult thing here is the large ovarian masses. I know we need to take care of those. The question is, would would ovarian cancer cause this much nausea and vomiting, or did we still need to look at with the distended stomach? Um, and you could do it either with a bar with a barren stu study or with an endoscopy. Um, uh, some some people probably would have tried to to work up her GI tract earlier. It really doesn't matter uh, what whether you got to it first or second. Yes, and that was um, and that was my kind of learning point from this case because you know a lot of times we treat the CT read as gospel. We you know we we may, may look at the image ourselves, but we'll you know, see what the radiologist says. And even radiologists warn us, you know, don't treat this as gospel. There's a reason that clinical correlation is necessary. Um, and clinically, when I took her history, I was like, you know, this sounds for all the world like a gastric outlet obstruction. You know, right. like she's not, you know, she's not keeping anything down. She's immediately vomiting it back up. Um, but on the CT scan, it just had these very like sort of nonspecific, maybe her stomach's a little dilated. Um, and so to me, this was, you know, you, it really requires the whole picture of, you know, it was a gastric outlet obstruction causing her nausea and vomiting, even though it wasn't really clearly seen on CT scan because her gastric cancer was so, um, like, so minimum, like they, there just like, wasn't a lot of thickening on the CT scan right. for them to call it. And so, you know, I think initially the ovarian cancer was chased because that was what the CT scan indicated that that was the major problem. Um, and then, but you're right, Dr. Centaur, my other learning point from this case was, you know, continue to ask questions if things don't add up and be willing to get that second CT scan and see, you know, now that we have more information, is there something else going on? And, and the other thing, and, uh, you know, I talk about this all the time, is if, if the CT scan is confusing, go, actually going and talking to the radiologist and, and looking at it with the radiologist, it's amazing how important that can be and how it sometimes uh, gets them to look at it in a, in a more careful way. There's a big literature on diagnostic errors in radiology. Um, uh, there's a big literature in internal medicine also. Uh, I'm not saying that there's that radiologists are any better or any worse. We all make a lot of diagnostic errors, and it, and having an internist and uh, a radiologist look at the film together. Uh, I've had multiple uh, examples uh, at the VA where that has informed where we're going and uh, helped us make diagnoses that we might have missed by just looking at the report. Right, and I think in this case, you know, the, on that second CT scan, we had more data. Like we knew that we knew the pathology of yeah. the tumors and so we knew what we were looking for yeah. um, and that really helped. That's great. Well, thanks a lot. I do have one comment about thiamine real quickly. Um, I just got off service on Tinsley and we had two different patients who had thiamines checked at admission and they were admitted long enough to where it actually came back low um, mm -hmm. <laughs> before they were discharged. Um, 
And I kind of always used to think what's really the point of getting it if you're going to repeat it empirically. But I guess I have another thought. <laughs> Sorry about my dogs. Um, but in those specific patients, so one was a decompensated cirrhotic. And so she had really bad sarcopenia. And so, you know, she would need, I think, continued repletion, whereas she came in with hepatic encephalopathy initially, which, you know, you could have easily, um, or she came in with encephalopathy, which you could easily attribute to hepatic encephalopathy, but she was profoundly deficient in her thymine level as well. Um, and then we had another patient who was just admitted with cardiac arrest, um, lived by himself, wasn't having good nutrition, but, you know, if it's someone that has the risk factors that they're likely going to have when they leave the hospital, if it's happened once and it's really a non-correctable pathology that could happen again, I'm now sending them at home on thymine as well. So I yeah, did find I, it to be a little bit helpful. <laughs> I think that, that we, um, we under, uh, under emphasize the importance of uh, giving thymine into a patient like this uh, we, we think about it in people who uh, have alcohol use disorder a lot, but anybody who's cachectic, uh, uh, losing weight and having uh, dietary issues or may have uh, an unusual diet, I think that uh, you don't have to give huge amounts of thiamine, but if you just give a reasonable amount of thiamine uh, each day, uh, you can prevent a lot of things because it can cause lactic acidosis it could cause this GI distress. There's a, this GI distress could have been uh, a thiamine deficiency. There is a gastric berry berry. Uh, so uh, just I try to keep in the back of my mind when I'm on the wards that uh, is, it, is it thiamine. And sometimes the thiamine level can be normal um, and you have to get uh, transketolase to make the diagnosis. Um, but that's really pretty unusual. Um, and most of the time we can, we just treat them empirically and ho hopefully we, we help them. Awesome, well, great case, Julie. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. Thank you all.